Good morning. Welcome to Messiah this morning. Today we're going to be uh, looking at texts from the Corinthian letters. And those letters were written by Paul to a community that was deeply divided, that it was in conflict with leadership. It was torn up. And Paul tries to communicate them with them to focus on their true vision, to focus on why they exist, that they are the fragile beholders of this power called love, God's power, God is love. And so I thought it would be fitting this morning to begin our worship service by looking at Messiah's vision. Imagine a place open and inviting to all, welcoming those in need and searching for the word of God. Imagine a community of disciples, guided by the Spirit, learning to know the Lord, studying the word, and sharing the good news. Imagine laity and staff set free, caring and authentic, hungry for ministry, discovering their gifts, alert to the opportunities around them. Imagine excited youth growing, learning, committed, filled with possibilities of living life guided by the gospel. Imagine a congregation renewed and renewing, sustained by prayer, equipped through worship, alive to the Spirit, seeing Christ in every face with all the resources necessary for growing ministries. Imagine wounds being healed, the lost being found, the hungry being fed, hope replacing despair, and lives being changed. Messiah, with God's help and guidance, will be transformed in welcome to welcome all the meet, all to meet Jesus' renewing love, learn to live as his disciples, and develop their gifts to offer care and healing in his name. May it be so. Amen. Let us worship. True. 
Not in the dark of buildings can find me Not in some heaven my tears away Here in this place a new light is shining Now is the kingdom and now is the day Gather us soon and hold us forever Gather us in and make us your own Gather us in, all people together Fire of love in our flesh and our Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we still were sinners. And for his sake, Christ forgives us all our sins. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please take this time to share the peace with one another. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, throughout time you free the oppressed, heal the sick, and make whole all that you have made. Look with compassion on the world wounded by sin, and by your powers restore us to wholeness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
The first lesson is a reading from the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The word of the Lord. And the second lesson is from the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh, so death is at work in us, but life in you. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to St. Mark, the second chapter. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. 
The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read that David did what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was the high priest and ate the bread of the presence which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. And he said to the man, who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Gospel of the Lord. You You may be seated, and I invite the kids to come forward for children's message. way over there. (laughs) All right. Good morning. So do any of you, like at school or in sports or anything like that, um, have to do stretching exercises? You know what they are? So like, like anybody do like the arm stretch like this? Yeah, that's a good one. Or you touch your toes. Yep. Yep. Or, or um, what's another one? What's another stretch? Yep. That's a good one. Oh, that feels good. Yeah. Stretching's good for us. We should all stretch. And um, stretching feels good. It heals our bodies to stretch, especially after we've done something like running or played ball or whatever. It helps us. Um, when we stretch. But we can also stretch our brains, and that's something important for us to do too. And in today's story, we have a a man who uh, has a withered hand, so it's kind of like curled in like this. And Jesus tells the man, um, well, first the man says to Jesus, look at my hand. It can't stretch out, right? Because Jesus says, stretch out your hand. Look at my hand. I can't, I can't stretch it out. It's, it's all curved in. It's all um, unstretchable. And Jesus says again, stretch out your hand. And this time the man's like, oh, fine. Okay, I'll try stretching it out. And he can stretch it out. And it's a miracle. Right? Jesus heals his hand, and he's able to stretch his hand. Well, Jesus is also saying things that are stretching people's minds. It's making them think a little, you know how when you stretch, you got to kind of be a little, push yourself a little farther than you maybe want to go. You don't want to go too far, but you kind of push a little farther. You know how that feels in your body? Well, that's kind of what Jesus' words are for us sometimes. In our minds, it makes us think a little farther, a little stretch beyond what we thought was possible. And when we do that, just like stretching heals our bodies, stretching our minds and thinking a little beyond what we thought was possible can heal our minds and be of good for us as well, especially when it's around Jesus' words. So that's our good news today. Let yourself stretch your minds. Yeah. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who shares your challenging words. 
that stretch our brains and heal our bodies. Help us to say yes to Jesus' words. Thank you and amen. Have a seat. That stretching felt good. <laughs> Today's um, scripture. When I finished the, reading the gospel, I thought, oh, that's one of those where you say the word of the Lord, and you're like, how is not a happy word? You know, they all, the whole story ends with, with the Pharisees and the Herodians teaming up to scheme against Jesus, the word of the Lord. We also had our reading from 2 Corinthians, which just reading... Verses 5 through 12 through chap- from chapter 4. It's, it's a kind of a famous line that we are but uh, cl- jars of clay. Uh, kind of, you see it in wall hangings and things like that. And it sort of has a trivialness to it now when it's taken out of context. <laughs> so tonight, I, today I might stretch your minds as you realize the context <laughs> in which these letters were written. Second Corinthians is actually the third letter of Paul's to the congregation in Corinth that he had uh, planted and Apollos had grown and watered. A congregation in a rather metropolitan area, an area of great diversity, in which uh, the Christian church was slowly growing in little segments here and there. And it was, for a time, kind of Paul's success story, you know? It was that, oh, he's the planter of the church in Corinth. And then there were some divisions that came about. And Paul's relationship with the Corinthians became one that was found to be very strained. This letter, the 2 Corinthians letter, which is actually the third letter, references the second letter. The second letter is lost to us. We do not know what the second letter said, except that Paul refers to it in 2 Corinthians as the letter of tears is what it's known as, uh, because he, he writes that he wrote it in tearful anguish. So can you imagine what this letter must have been like? It's too bad it was lost. It would have been really amazing to see. We know from the book of Acts and from the first Corinthians, so the first letter, that Paul had left Corinth to live and work in Ephesus. And at the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul says that he expects to visit Corinth. And at the beginning of 2 Corinthians, he speaks of being reluctant to make another painful visit. So can you imagine, like, what is going on? We don't know the whole story. But this second letter, as well as the first, but certainly this, or third letter, I should say, is intended to mend broken relationship with Corinthians. He's urging them, despite the fact that they are hosting leaders who speak blatantly against Paul, in this letter he is urging them to be loyal to Christ, to be loyal to Paul, to be loyal to the gospel Paul preached to them and to be loyal to the promise they have made to provide for the church in Jerusalem. In other words, pay your synod fees. That's basically what he's saying. 
And Paul's trying to restore this strained relationship between church leadership and the people he loves. He loves these people. They were the first. According to Luther Seminary professor Mary Hinkle Shore, Paul chooses his words carefully in this letter. He chooses them carefully to prevent the relationship from deteriorating any more than it has. But he's also having a really hard time keeping his emotions in check. So he's constantly framing his letter in the theological concept of God's reconciling work in Christ, in the work of grace, in the work of forgiveness. And this whole correspondence of letters began when the fighting factions wrote to Paul for guidance, asking, what shall we do with all these divisions in our church? And we find in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14, Paul's first response to that an address to the issues of diversity and division within a church. It's a phenomenal two chapters. If you've ever had division and, and diverse opinions within your congregation, that's a good Bible study. But don't forget 1 Corinthians 13. There's a reason that they say 12, 13, and 14 are written the way they are. 12 and 14 are like sandwich bread. And 13's the peanut butter. Now, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is a favorite poem that's often heard at weddings. But it's actually intended to address congregations. To mend brokenness. Second Corinthians chapter 4 is like Paul taking what he's already laid out in his thesis of chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians and taking it a little more theologically deep in that he says that we are like clay jars. He's addressing our fragility, the vulnerability, our fact that we will have factions in our church, that we do have divisions, and there is brokenness, and cracks happen, and contained within those clay jars is love. Remember, God is love. So when we say there's love in those clay jars, that means there's the divine in our broken beings and those broken beings in relationship with each other. One of the best images of this, I think, is found in the book of Revelation, when John of Patmos is writing his letters to the seven churches, and he's speaking the truth in love, and he lays it out. Some of them are lukewarm, some of them are self-conceited, some of them are abusing their power, some of them have just flickered out. And he has this image about midway through the book of Revelation on which he comes upon the one who is called the Son of Man. And there's this beautiful description of the Son of Man. And, and beside the Son of Man are seven flames. And those seven flames are the church. And those flames flicker and they dim and they come up and down and they are wavering all around. But to God, they are stars in the sky because that is where the Son of Man is found. So in all our fragility and our vulnerability and our clay jars, the divine is found there. That is where you will find the Son of Man. Where two or more are gathered, there I shall be also. And this is the message that Paul is trying to communicate to the Corinthians that there is something more going on. That when we proclaim Jesus as Christ and as our Lord, 
that we are being called to a relationship with each other, a service to each other, not for recognition or honor or our own power, but that our true purpose is actually service and relationship. So even though our text is from 2 Corinthians, I want to use the poem from 1 Corinthians 13 because I think that this is all connected and that Paul probably used that as a basis thesis and it just wasn't getting across. So here comes the third letter where he goes even theologically deeper. But instead of diving into the theology, let's stick with the beauty of the poem because I think it says most purely what Paul is trying to say in his text of the treasure in clay jars. I love the words that are found towards the end of the poem, that we live in a moment of seeing dimly in which we are fully known, yet do not fully know or understand. The promise rests in God being love even when we are not fully loving. It says love is patient. It's one of the kind of famous, the minute I say love is patient, you start saying that poem a little because you've heard it at weddings. You've heard it and over the years you probably have a wall hanging somewhere. Love is patient. Love is kind. In the King James Version, it says, love suffereth long. And the Bible tells us the story of a long-suffering God. And this may not be the way you've seen God in your life, but go with me here. There's a lot of evidence in the Bible that our God is a long-suffering God. Because that's God's nature, for God is love, and love suffereth long. Some examples you may find in the stories of the Old Testament. How the people doubted and rebelled and broke God's laws and sought to empower themselves without God. They had to have kings. I know, God's our king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have to have kings. We have to have our own power. We have to have our kingdom. Well, that's fine. We have the kingdom of God. Yeah, right, right. But we got to be. And God's patient through it all. Does not give up. And then we have the story of Christ's crucifixion. Jesus died on the cross for our doubt and our rebellion and our self-centeredness. And love can bear anything and cover anything. That this love carries the burden and the blame of our hearts. That love believes the best in us, yet sees the truth truth of our worst moments. Long-suffering God. That love is of God and can evolve in our darkest moments. For love is the ultimate freedom. We cannot lose, though we may lose faith or hope. Love will not abandon us. Think of that. One of the best examples of love's enduring power was documented by Viktor Frankl. He is a survivor of three years in Auschwitz. Frankl is also a pioneer in the study of psychology. And he observed human behavior while he was surviving in the concentration camp and then wrote a book that I think everyone should read at least once in their life. It's a must read. It's called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Man's Search for Meaning. Life-changing book. He wrote, We who lived in the concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others giving away their last piece of bread. They have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's own way. If I have not loved, then I have nothing. 
Paul understood this power and strength of love, this choosing one's way, and the difference between choosing the way of love and the way away from love. There is a strength in love that is actually comes to blossom in brokenness. We can see it in nature. We can see it in the story of our faith. A rainbow is broken light. Think of a bud. It has to be broken in order for the flower to appear. The body and heart of Christ are broken on the cross that we may be free of judgment. Love is for the broken, and it mends us to wholeness. Eugene Peterson's contemporary version of the Message Bible says this in the, uh, it would be the last few verses of 1 Corinthians 13. We do not see things clearly. We are squinting in a fog, appearing through the mist, but it's not, it will not be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We will see it all then, see it clearly as God sees it, knowing God as directly as God knows us. But for right now, until that completeness comes, we have three things. We have trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, and love extravagantly. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly, love extravagantly. These are the words Paul is writing to a divided community. Paul reminds this community that there is more going on in the events of their lives than any of them could see that there is an assurance that Paul's offering that what we know or think is right may not be all there is, that there is something more deeper in the world than this, that the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit is the lightness of knowing that we are known by a God who is love whose characters and features are love. So I close with words that were found on a piece of paper in a pocket of a Confederate soldier over a hundred years ago, because they contain a certain wisdom as we think about these clay jars that we are and the extraordinary power, love, which lives within them. I asked God for strength that I might achieve, and I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have praise I was given weakness, that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all these things, that I might enjoy life. I was given life, that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I hoped for. It's an amazing thing things we do not know, and the God who loves us into having all we hoped for. So remember, but we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Amen.
Filled with the Holy Spirit, we join with the church in every place, praying for the world that God so loves. God, our strength, you command your people to keep the Sabbath. Coax your church away from the busyness of the world and give us holy rest so that refreshed, we will give vibrant witness to your world healing love. Hear us, O God. God, our strength, you restore what is withered. As all creation stretches forth in hunger and thirst for you, revive what has ceased to flourish and repair what has fallen into decay. Make us partners in your holy healing. Hear us, O God. God of strength, we ache for peace. Teach nations that you carry our burdens, you free human hands, and you rescue us in distress. Raise up leaders in the world who listen to your voice and walk in your ways. Hear us, O God. God, our strength, people are afflicted and perplexed, persecuted and struck down. Shine the light of your glory into the hearts of your suffering ones especially Heidi, BJ, and Amy, so that they will not be crushed, driven to despair, or forsaken. Hear us, O God. God, our strength, you grieve our hardness of heart whenever we turn your holy counsel into rules to control others. Open our hearts to your loving will for these times, for our neighbors and for this community of faith. Hear us, O God. God, our strength, death is at work in us, but life is in you. Free us now to live into your promise of indestructible life, and in the end, restore us with all the saints, especially the martyrs of Uganda and John the 23rd, the Bishop of Rome. Hear us, O God. By the sure guidance of your Holy Spirit, O God, we lift up our prayers in trust and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the offering.
Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it, open our hearts to embrace it, and open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come, let us eat, for now the feast is spread. You may be seated. All are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness. Uh, you may stand or kneel along the railings, and you'll be given the bread or, uh, and dark liquid, which is wine, or light liquid, which is grape juice. And there are gluten-free elements available. Come, let us eat.
invite you to please stand and receive the blessing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his love. Amen. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace, for you are Lord forevermore. Amen. Amen. As far as announcements today, I invite you to please look at the messenger. I don't think there's any other from the congregation. Okay. In two weeks, what happens? Vacation Bible School, absolutely, and we're gearing up for that. We have a meeting this Tuesday at 5 o'clock in the choir room for anyone who wants to join us. We are still looking for crew leaders and people to help out. So if you have a few hours, even if it's just one evening, dinner's from 4.45 till 5.20, VBS starts at 5.30. Um, we'll have our ending at about uh, 7.40, and then it's over at 8 o'clock. So if you haven't registered your children, please do that. If you want to be a volunteer, please do that. Contact me if you need to know anything about it. We try to put on a great vacation Bible school here. My granddaughter, when she found out we were coming to church with us today, she says, is it vacation Bible school? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, not today. So anyway, they get a lot out of it and they remember. It's important for us to do this for our children. Thank you. I think Rose has something. You guys can have said. <laughs> have a seat. I just want to, um say a couple words ahead of the um, last part of our service today. Uh, first of all, I want to commend these 10 ladies. Um, Vicki, Donnell, and Jean Barty answered the Holy Spirit's call back in, um, I think it was April of 2017. And somewhere, somehow, they realized that this congregation really would be blessed with a Stephen ministry program. And so they undertook to go to St. Louis and take the leaders training, which was a lot of work and a lot of prayer and a lot of study. And since then, um, there have been eight wonderful women from this congregation who have answered the Holy Spirit's call to go through the very extensive 50 plus hours of work, uh, just the 50 hours that Vicki and Jean have led, plus all their prayers and study. And now we're going to be commissioning them today to go forward. And I just want everyone to, want to know that this is truly a blessing for all of our congregation. And these 10 women are truly blessed to be a blessing. And soon we will be sending these um, caregivers out to serve care receivers. So keep your ears and eyes open for what it entails to be a care receiver. And then number two, as soon as the service, worship service is over, I want to invite everyone to come out in, in the library area, have some muffins, coffee, juice, and... Um, just give a word of encouragement and a hug to these 10 ladies. Thank you. So today we act as the body of Christ to recognize and support those who do ministry of Stephen leaders and ministers among us in Christ's home, in Christ's name. Baptized into Christ's priesthood, we are each called to offer ourselves in service, sometimes in specialized ministry, as each of these people are doing right now. So I invite at this time Stephen leaders and ministers to please come forward. Um, ministers and the side leaders over here. Jean and Vicki, you have been trained as Stephen leaders, and because of your gifts, your callings, and your training, you have been charged with these responsibilities. To build awareness of Stephen's ministry within Messiah Lutheran Church's congregation, 
to solicit the commitment of the congregation to Stephen Ministry at every opportunity to recruit, select, and train as Stephen ministers those members whose gift it is to share one-on-one -on -one caring ministry, to work with the pastor of this congregation to identify members who could benefit from this confidential caring ministry, to assign the trained caregiver who most appropriately fits a person's needs, to supervise those caring relationships and offer regular opportunities for continuing growth in the skills and practice of caring ministry. Will you assume these ministry, this ministry in the confidence that it comes from God? I will, and I ask God to help me. Members of Messiah Lutheran Church, will you with open your hearts to the ministry of Stephen leaders and pray for them as servants of God. Yes. So now let us recognize eight parishioners who have chosen to become Stephen ministers. Those, these individuals have been meeting weekly since the new year, absorbing 50 hours of training in order to be prepared to walk with the person that is hurting and having issues. They learned how to listen and how just being there for someone can be a healing, graceful experience for that person that they are caring for, as well as for themselves. The Spirit has called them to this ministry, and they have said yes. We are taking a few moments now to ask the Messiah Lutheran community to support them by praying for them and asking God to be with them in this new ministry. To our new candidates, you have been equipped to serve as Stephen ministers at Messiah Lutheran Church. Each of you has been comforted by God with the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We ask you now to join in serving our Lord and those in our congregation who need to be comforted. As the Lord Jesus took the burdens of the world on his shoulder and has been a friend to you in troubled times, we ask you to be a friend to those who are burdened under the stress of daily life. Are you prepared to meet those requests that are asked of you? Yes, with the help of God. Are you prepared to nurture the skills you have learned and use them in service to others to support, encourage, build up, and comfort people in all their needs? Now we ask you, the members of Messiah Lutheran Church, to open your hearts to the ministry of these people and to pray for them, that they may be effective servants of Christ. Will you accept the ministry when you need support? Allow these individuals to work with you as you face struggles in your life and receive support and help from Christ through these Stephen ministers. If you are prepared to meet this request and would like to pray for these people, please say yes. Let us pray. O oh God, we ask you to take these servants into your care. You have blessed them with particular gifts and talents and have provided them with an opportunity to learn more about helping others. May they serve you with the power of the Holy Spirit. May they be quick to serve, patient in listening, willing to share themselves with others. Give to us who receive their ministry a thankful heart for them and show them in times of stress and satisfaction, a special measure of your mercy and joy. Keep them strong in the faith you have given them for the sake of Jesus, who cares for us all. Amen. And I invite you to extend um, both your hands in blessing toward these minister, to these leaders and uh, ministers of Stephen's ministry. And you may kind of do that and just reach them out. We're going to get a little Pentecostal on you today, okay? So we're, we're, we're just going to go there. We're doing it. We're doing it. Let us pray. O loving God, we praise and thank you for these people that said yes to you. We thank you for their courage, for their faith. We thank you for their dedication. We thank you for their love. We ask a special blessing on them and their families. We thank you for giving them the courage to step forward, 
Give them the courage to listen with all their heart and to love with their whole heart. Give them the wisdom and insight to know when you are at work and to respond to it. And may they know how much we love and appreciate what they are doing for us. So we lift this in prayer in the name of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now please stand and receive the benediction. I arise today through the mighty strength, Christ in me and Christ with me. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ on my right and Christ on my left, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye of everyone who sees me, Christ in the ear of everyone who hear, listens to me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the power of the three in one, creator, spirit, and Christ. Amen. Let us sing. May be seated. in peace serve the lord <laughs>